As always, please take a moment to try to answer the question on your own before moving on. In order to understand the solution to this question, we have to first understand the concept of a linear charge density. Now that is usually symbolized by the Greek letter lambda, and all it is is the total amount of charge on a rod or other object divided by its length. Now sometimes we use L for the length. In this case, because we have a curved section of rod, we're going to use the letter S, just because that's a traditional letter to use for curved lengths. Okay, so we know the linear charge density is the amount of charge divided by the length. Now, it turns out to be useful in this case not to look at the entire length of the rod itself, but just a very small section of the length of the rod. They usually call these small sections differential elements, and the symbol we would use is ds. So ds would represent the length of a very small section of the rod. Indeed, the linear charge density equation can be written as lambda equals dq over ds. It's basically the same formula, except we're looking at very tiny lengths of the rod and therefore very tiny charges, dq, of the rod. Now in this equation, if we multiply both sides by ds, we could solve for dq, and we're going to see that's a useful result for later. So we see that dq is equal to lambda times ds. Let's circle that. We'll hold on to that for later. So we want to go back to this differential element, and we want to note that because it's positively charged, the electric field that it would produce would point away from that differential element. We know that positive charges produce electric fields that point away from those positive charges. If we had another differential element, perhaps over here, it too would be producing an electric field that points away from it. Now what's interesting is that the x component of this red electric field and the x component of the black electric field would cancel each other out. They're pointing in completely opposite directions, so those could cancel. The y components, of course, do not cancel. So the y component of the black electric field points down, and the y component of the red electric field also points down. They certainly do not cancel. They actually are pointing in the same direction as opposed to the opposite direction. But the point is that we only need to consider the y components. So we're going to just take note of that. We're only looking at the y components of the electric field. The x components cancel each other out and therefore can be neglected. So keep this idea in mind. Next, we have to turn to the equation for the electric field produced by a point charge. Now, of course, that's the electric field produced by a point charge. If we were looking at the electric field produced by a differential element of charge, then all we would have to do is put a D in front of the electric field and a D in front of the Q. Ah, but remember, we said that DQ was equal to lambda times DS, so we can make a substitution. Now, let's not forget that we only have to consider the y components of the electric field, so we can multiply this by sine of theta, and that way we rule out the x components and focus exclusively on those y components. Now, we're getting ready to integrate both sides of this equation. That way we can change dE into just E, which is the electric field. That's what we are looking for. The only problem is there are two variables on the right-hand side of this equation. There is s and theta. But we recall, perhaps from a trigonometry class, that s, the arc length, is equal to the radius times the central angle. It's also true that ds is equal to radius times d theta. And so we can replace ds with r d theta and that way we'll be able to put the equation in terms of a single variable theta. Now the radius in the numerator and a radius in the denominator can cancel. And so we're finally ready to integrate both sides of this equation. So the left side is eventually going to become just e. On the right side we have to choose our limits of integration. Remember right now we're calculating the electric field produced by the upper positive ring so we can integrate from an angle of zero radians all the way around the positive ring to where it stops, which would be an angle of pi radians. So we'll put zero and pi for our limits of integration. Also, let's not forget that these values here are constants, so they can be removed from the integral. The integral of sine theta d theta is, of course, negative cos theta. We've put the negative sign out in front. We'll plug in our upper limit, our lower limit next, and then subtract. The cosine of pi is negative 1 and the cosine of 0 is positive 1, so negative 1 minus positive 1 will be negative 2. And this negative and that negative can make it overall positive. So here it is, the final expression for the electric field produced by the positive charge. Let's not forget that lambda was the total charge divided by the length, which we symbolize with s. Well, the length of this arc right here is just half of a circumference, only half of a circumference. A full circumference, of course, is 2 pi times the radius. That means that half of that, if we divided that by 2, would just give us pi times the radius. So 
lambda can be replaced with the charge divided by the length of pi r. And then a little bit of algebra here, push that pi r down to the denominator to make pi r squared. And we finally have the expression for the electric field, but that's only of the positive charge. We have not even done the negative ring of charge here, but there is some good news. If we took a differential element right here, we know that electric fields point towards negative charge. Remember the bottom ring is negatively charged. And so you're going to notice if we took another differential element that we'd be painting the same picture that we painted above with the positive ring. In other words, the X components of the negative ring of charge will cancel, but the Y components will not cancel. And indeed they point in the same direction as the Y components of the positive rings electric field. So what that all means is that the electric field produced by the negative ring is the same as the electric field produced by the positive ring. So all we need to do is multiply this expression by two in order to account for both the positive and the negative ring of charge. So now we have the overall electric field. And we just have to plug in all the known values. Remember that Q was given in picocoulombs, so you have to multiply that by 10 to the minus 12 to get it into coulombs. The R was given in centimeters, so you'll have to multiply that by 10 to the minus 2 to get it into meters. And when you process that on your calculator, you should get approximately 23.8 newtons per coulomb as the magnitude of the electric field. Now, what about the direction? No problem, we remember that the electric field was composed of just the Y components of the electric fields of those differential elements. All the Y components are pointing downward. So that means the overall electric field will also be pointing downward. The question wants us to give an angle relative to the positive direction of the X axis. Well, downward would simply be negative 90 degrees relative to the X axis. So that would be the correct direction. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video. If you liked it, please subscribe to the channel. Also, you are welcome to send in your own question to the email address shown on the screen.